So welcome back guys. So in my previous lecture I talked about and discussed in detail about the cavernous sinus thrombosis. If a patient comes to your OPD with cavernous sinus thrombosis, how you can actually identify that. So in today's lecture I'm going to talk about yet another syndrome which is called as the orbital apex syndrome and by the anatomy the orbital apex consists of two important structures which is the first one as the orbital uh, canal that's the optic canal and the second one is the superior orbital fissure. Now, I've given the link in my description panel about those two individual videos which I had made before. One is of the optic canal anatomy and the other one is the superior orbital fissure anatomy. Those two are separate videos. You can go and check them out and after that you can come back and see this video. So if at all the contents of the orbital apex that is the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery which is the optic canal contents as you can see over here and the contents of the superior orbital fissure which you can see over here which is lateral to the optic canal are compressed at the same time the patient may present with symptoms and signs that will come under the heading orbital apex syndrome now we were very clear about the signs and symptoms about the cavernous sinus thrombosis in my previous video for which the link also i'll be giving in the description panel so in very short in this video i would like to say what the patient goes through what signs and symptoms what examination what what investigations you can do to identify that the patient is having orbital apex syndrome in an initial stage and then how that orbital apex syndrome can be differentiated with individual superior orbital fissure syndrome and how it can progress further to cause the cavernous sinus thrombosis which could be unilateral or bilateral so the first things first we know that the optic canal now the etiology of the cavernous sinus thrombosis superior orbital fissure syndrome and the orbital apex syndrome are all the same it could be post traumatic it could be infective it could be granulomatous it could be an obstruction because of the uh, tumors which may be benign or malignant rhabdomyosarcoma lymphoma it could be iatrogenic as in if the patient is being operated for a fest surgery and the surgeon breaches the lamina papyracea and breaks the blood supply and it causes orbital hematoma which causes compression on the uh, you know the ophthalmic artery the optic nerve which can lead to blindness so all these are various uh, causative agents. Also the most common, uh, we know that the bacteria which is involved is the gram positive, staph, strep, then the gram negative, fusiform bacteria, proteus bacteria, then the pseudomonas, aeruginosa, various other anaerobic bacteria and all. But the most common, uh, you know, the orbital apex syndrome. Now, the orbital apex syndrome, which is commonly seen also in cases of invasive fungal sinusitis, uh, in cases of invasive mucormycosis, you can always see that the patient has lost his vision. Uh, there is diplopia, there is ophthalmoplasia. In cases of uh, the invasive fungal sinusitis, aspergillus conditions. Also, there is one particular fungi, which is the pseudoallosteria boidi, which is commonly linked with the orbital apex syndrome. So that is because of the isolated sinusitis, which may lead to orbital apex syndrome later on. So these are the causative agents. We need to know the anatomy of first. Now the basic region, the basic, the basic concept for you guys to understand uh, the basic, uh, you know, the knowledge about the orbital apex syndrome is to know the contents of the orbital apex which is the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure now if you go and watch that video of mine before you can be very sure about the contents of the superior orbital fissure now the superior orbital fissure has three compartments the lower one is the inferior ophthalmic vein superior part the middle compartment consists of third cranial nerve with two heads in between the nasociliary nerve and then we have the sixth cranial nerve that is the abducens nerve and then we have in the uppermost compartment the LFT the liver function test LFT L stands for lacrimal nerve F for frontal nerve T for trochlear nerve and then we have one more superior ophthalmic vein so these are the contents of the superior orbital fissure if the superior orbital fissure is compressed all these cranial nerve neuropathies we're gonna see uh, we're gonna see v1 involvement the most important condition the most important point you have to remember that in this 
uh, in cases of cavernous sinus thrombosis where the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus is involved the v2 was also involved that's the second branch that's the maxillary nerve of trigeminal nerve but in cases of orbital apex syndrome you will never see the v2 involvement because here only the v1 that's the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is involved so that's the huge basic difference in these two conditions uh, of the cavernous sinus thrombosis and the orbital apex syndrome so the v2 will not be involved in this situation in the sof but the v1 will be majorly involved so the patient will come to your opd uh, the patient will come to your opd with symptoms such as loss of vision diplopia ophthalmoplasia painful eye movement um, then restricted eye movement now uh, in this case the patient may not have a swollen eyelid a bluish red peri or vital inflammation edema or a raccoon eye sign or a traumatic eye sign it may not be present because this is in the posterior most region of the you know the superior orbital fissure so the eyelids may not be involved initially the veins may not be engorged directly the patient may complain of loss of vision uh, diplopia because of the ophthalmoplasia internal extrinsic or intrinsic but later on if the patient does not get treatment may have the engorged veins or compressed veins uh, because of the superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior ophthalmic vein drainage they may later on have the puffy eyelids and the swollen eyelids as we saw in the cavernous sinus thrombosis syndrome so that is the main difference as well along with the v2 involvement which is absent in this condition so you need to remember the patient will have a fixed dilated pupil the patient will have afferent uh, rapd afferent pupillary defect the patient will also have a lot of changes in the fundoscopy because of the optic nerve compression and usually the blindness in this condition if not treated soon enough is usually irreversible because if it takes too much of time the patient may lose the vision so this prompt treatment is necessary the patient requires urgent mri and ct scan to rule out sinus infections especially posterior sphenoid group and posterior ethmoid group infections uh, the complications may arise is that the patient may land up into meningitis so initially the superior orbital fissure and the ophthalmic artery may be involved if there is an infectious bacterial uh, infection may uh, also lead to subperiosteal or vital abscess the abscess may rupture the veins may be involved and the meningeal layers may also be involved through the emissary veins the venous connections may enter into the cavernous sinus eventually and then eventually it may spread to the opposite side so the orbital apex syndrome may eventually also lead to the cavernous sinus thrombosis eventually if no treatment takes place and may breach the dura may cause meningitis now the orbital abscess may eventually lead to intracranial cerebral abscess and all that conditions we can see so the investigations of choice is rapid CD our MRI to differentiate the cause and surgical intervention is of utmost importance for the patient's benefit so we see a lot of cases in ENT surgery uh, that patient is having a lot of invasive fungal sinusitis palatal destruction or vital destruction proptosis later on suggesting that the patient is having invasive involvement and later on eventually it causes cavernous sinus thrombosis from the orbital apex now as you can see on this uh, 3d model over here this is the distribution of the ophthalmic artery its course and its termination into various different branches this is all i have covered in my previous lectures and also you can see the opt the optic nerve which is right in the center of the optic canal covered with the dura matter over here so that's a meningeal layer now the patient may also have the v1 nerve involvement that's the ophthalmic branches which is uh, nfl that is the nasal ciliary frontal and the lacrimal nerve the patient may have dryness in the eye and you can see uh, that's the that's the ophthalmic nerve the v1 actually and you can see this is a supratrochlear nerve that's the medial branch of the supraorbital nerve that's the lateral branch of the supraorbital nerve and these are all the nerves which actually give a supply to the forehead cutaneous supply and this one here is the infratrochlear nerve so all these cutaneous sensations is lost because of the v1 supply uh, the corneal reflex is also affected 
So all these you have to keep in mind. And this is how you differentiate the cavernous sinus thrombosis with the orbital apex syndrome with the involvement of the SOF and the optic canal. So if the optic canal is not involved and it is kind of anteriorly to the optic canal, it may involve the superior orbital fissure and the superior orbital fissure stand out, stand alone. Uh, syndrome is called as the SOF syndrome. The patient will present with all of the following eye changes similar to that of the cavernous sinus thrombosis but without the involvement of the V2 and also there will be no involvement of the optic nerve and the patient's blindness is absent. There will be no blindness. Uh, the patient will have a normal vision just with ophthalmoplasia and uh, also the pupils may be uh, completely normal unless the oculomotor nerve is involved in which the parasympathetic nerve supply if affected may result into mydriasis so that is that is all about mostly the orbital apex syndrome if you have any more points to add to this topic you can feel free to add into the comment section or if you think i have not spoken completely about this condition uh, you can just feel free to let me know in the comment section below you can you can add to your point of view now i'm sorry i could not post any any patient photograph because of some issues in the legality of the uh, the youtube partner program they don't allow me to post you know the pictures of serious conditions of patients so this that is why i'm just giving an audio uh, with a 3d model over here so i hope you understood this lecture very clearly and if at all you have any doubts let me know and the next lecture i will be talking about the exact differentiation with visual representation of a table showing three columns of superior sof syndrome cavernous sinus thrombosis and orbital apex syndrome in which condition which is what is positive and what is negative so that all these three conditions you will be able to understand very clearly thoroughly so uh, I hope you understood this lecture. Till then, take care, guys. Thank you so much.